Welcome, people. Here is a lecture, first in a series of lectures on audio signal processing. Uh, I will try to take you through a lot of interesting facts and demos. Um, typically two halves, first half synthesis, second half processing, and then the third half, ha, the analysis. Um, cool, probably about five, six lectures, we'll see how this goes. Deep breath, and here we go. Uh, by the way, all the examples will be in Super Collider, but we will actually focus on theory, so uh, likely you can um, produce similar examples in Max MSP, PD, whatever you're using. Okay, so the first one to do has everything to do with oscillations, big chunk of stuff on oscillations and the intro on sampling, um, just to make it complete. Uh, I won't spend much time on sampling, but note a few important things. So where does it come from? Uh, it comes from encoding electrical signals. Okay, so here's a little sketch where you see that sound is essentially an air pressure variation and then typically we use a transducer a microphone that converts air pressure variation into voltage variation and then comes the analog to digital converter ADC and after that we actually have numerical variations so numbers right so electric voltage is an analog signal meaning that it is analogous to the acoustic pressure wave variation, obviously to the extent that the microphone is uh, an accurate transducer. Uh, but in any case, there is no uh, time resolution limit here. Typically there is amplitude limit resolution uh, in the sense that you cannot cross a certain voltage. There is a maximum voltage that can be used in an electrical system. And as far as the minimum voltage goes, uh, it has everything to do with noise floor because it's inevitable in an electrical circuit. Uh, so you have a, some kind of a dynamic range. And then uh, in digital domain, well, it's just a set of numbers. So let's investigate how these numbers uh, come to be uh, and uh, investigate the limitations of the digital counterpart. Uh, so here we are actually limited in frequencies, uh, which is uh, a contrast to the electrical signals. I mean, no matter the fact that a lot of components might have a limitation on frequency, typically a microphone would, uh, electrical components can go really high frequency, uh, far, far beyond. I mean, obviously a computer has a, a, a CPU that runs at gigahertz rate uh, so you understand that um, that electronics are elect electrons can run back and forth really quickly much quicker than air pressure um, and obviously much quicker than what we can uh, detect with our ears so with the digital signal we have a frequency limitation uh, which has everything to do with the fact that microphones are limited and our hearing is limited. Um, we also will have a dynamic limitation, uh, pretty much due to the fact that the, the electrical systems have a dynamic limitation and our hearing has a dynamic limitation. Worth adding is that our hearing has a much larger dynamic range than uh, most of affordable electronics at least. Uh, which means that you can hear the noise floor in a, in a loudspeaker if you really come close, for example. Uh, cool, so uh, that's the sampling thing. And then a sketch of how this looks in terms of a continuous signal being sampled. So what you have here is a different uh, sampling rates. Uh, so the rate of samples, meaning the frequency of samples, how frequently do you uh, have a look, take a look at the waveform here and you note that voltage down 
that's typically your um, digital to analog conversion and then you see that with higher sampling rates with more samples per time uh, you will have a more accurate representation of the original signal uh, so uh, we typically measure the sampling rate in Hertz which is one per second so the amount of units per second um, so a 44 kilohertz sampling rate means that you have 44,000 samples for second each second. Okay, so the sampling is typically regular. Uh, the time duration between the samples is exactly the same. If it's not, we call it jitter and it's problematic. Really expensive sound cards have extremely low jitter. Uh, cheap stuff has a lot of jitter and therefore the accuracy of production reproduction isn't great uh, by the way there are things like uh, exponential sampling um, there is wild stuff in signal processing signal processing is a serious engineering subject that is worth uh, studying and typically in audio signal processing we do take the useful stuff and we typically don't go as deep as the engineers uh, but then again, uh, you, what we often find is that uh, engineers are very happy when they learn that there is an application to a lot of theory that they study and uh, develop. Okay, so about uh, the sampling regularity, uh, about the you know maximum sample rate, obviously you can increase it. More samples per second means more computation, more CPU expensive things. Um, now let's talk briefly about uh, reaching the limit of representing sound uh, in terms of sampling rate. So what I have here is uh, a kind of a same sample rate. So you see that the, the amount of dots is uh, the same, but I have increasing frequency. Okay, so uh, when when a waveform, uh, we'll talk about this in a bit more detail, but when the waveform is more compressed, there is more oscillations per second, then it is higher frequency. So we're increasing frequency. And what you see is that at the fixed sample rate, increasing frequency actually yields a less detailed representation. Okay, so we will always have problems, more problems with higher frequencies. And once we get near and beyond half of the sampling rate, then we get into trouble, okay? So the thing to understand is that if, uh, I mean, first of all, we represent the sampling rate in Hertz, kilohertz, but we can also represent and do represent the frequency of a periodic signal in kilohertz. So uh, it's the same unit. Okay, so what you see here is a simple oscillation at the sample rate. And you see that this one can just be represented. So in order, the maximum frequency that you can represent at this sampling rate is actually half of that. Because for each cycle of this oscillation, you need at least two samples. Right, you need to say, okay, this one is on top, this one is on bottom, top and bottom. So this is half the frequency, the sampling rate is half of this uh, frequency. And then you can kind of represent it. Now, obviously, you won't be able to represent any detail. But the problems really happen. Uh, this is problematic already, by the way, we'll talk about this in a second. But the real th problems start happening once you get a higher frequency than half the sample rate. And this is the funny thing that happens. You actually yield a lower frequency, much lower frequency than what you've put into the system. Because if you look at it carefully, if I don't have a dot, two dots per cycle here, I have less than if I start with this dot, right? Then the next dot will be beyond the lowest point. 
and according to this graph I'm having it somewhere here okay and then the next one again it will be way beyond the next top dot and according to this sampling graph here it should be this one here okay so uh, you're actually skipping cycles and the funny thing is once you do that consistently I might have messed this one up but if you do this consistently then and reconstruct the waveform surprise you will get a uh, same type of waveform at a much lower frequency and this is a kind of a phasing thing between the sampling frequency and the actual frequency of this oscillation um, and as you might expect the higher the frequency here the lower the output frequency will be once you reconstruct this signal so that's what happens above Nyquist frequency as, as we call it above half the sampling rate as you increase the input the output keeps decreasing so it acts actually as a mirror okay so this the Nyquist frequency is a mirror in, in spectrum everything that you want to have above it will actually land below it and this will be of great great significance okay uh, so this is exactly what I've just said except the interesting question what about the phase between the samples here and the input signal because you see in this case I have caught the top of the waveform the bottom the top the bottom and so on but if the time alignment isn't such I might have caught the zeros you see the, the zero points here are equally spaced as the peaks and troughs so actually what you could say is that at the uh, at half the sampling frequency the phase plays a crucial role because if I catch all the zeros then I won't reconstruct the waveform I will just get a silent signal coming out of there uh, now th this is just in theory the modern a analog to digital converters uh, don't suffer this issue I won't go into that okay so that's the that's the main message here remember half the sampling uh, rate is crucially the top limit and actually the usable bandwidth is somewhat lower this is debatable how much lower but in any case the sampling frequency is much higher so obviously you might uh, know that the basic uh, sampling frequency for audio is 44.1 kilohertz uh, and that you I mean I don't hear anything above 16 kilohertz if you're lucky and young maybe you go up to 18 uh, and that's dependent on amplitude again so if you really push 18 kilohertz very loud you're probably gonna hear something um, or other okay so uh, that's the main thing here uh, one thing added or a few things added uh, in terms of why do we need higher uh, sample rates than the 44.1 uh, typically in processing uh, we get a better uh, result a more accurate process uh, also in terms of analog to digital conversion uh, we have to use an analog anti-aliasing filter which typically filters the signal below the Nyquist frequency because as you've seen if I put in an analog signal that is higher has uh, contains higher frequencies it will actually mirror back and mess up the rest of my signal so I have to really steeply filter everything before and steep filters have problems we'll get into this probably in a few lectures uh, so because of steep filters having problems you're not making them hugely steep and therefore the tolerance here the spacing here is um, is generous um, 
I've, uh, so in terms of processing, definitely can help. Uh, typically processes that create harmonics, clipping distortion, we'll talk about these. Uh, they're better off run at higher sampling rate. And another thing added is that no matter the fact that we can't hear above 17, 18 kilohertz, uh, our time sensitivity relates to higher frequencies actually because the time difference that you can detect between left and the right ear is down to 10 microseconds which corresponds to 100 kilohertz so what you're likely to experience if you have a chance uh, and uh, record uh, maybe a, a very spacious event or, or orchestra with uh, with amazing microphones amazing converters everything amazing and then uh, have a, a really decent listening environment control room and you listen to these uh, listen to different um, sampling rates uh, it is likely that you will hear better spatial detail with a higher sampling rate and this has to do with the interaural time difference okay so uh, briefly about uh, the what we can call the vertical resolution of your sampling which is our bit depth which has to do with the grid essentially because in, in a digital system uh, I mean we, we have been creating a kind of a horizontal grid here so for every grid point we uh, measure the voltage but actually the measurements in terms of voltage also come on a grid uh, which has to do with the precision of the numbers that you're using and that's why we're talking about bits because the more bits you use for uh, a number in a digital system the more accurate your number will be the more uh, resolution you have so with the 16-bit accuracy we have uh, 64,000 a bit more steps from the maximum amplitude to the minimum amplitude so it's a fairly dense grid but actually as you probably know already uh, we have higher precision available most often these days which is 24 bit and internally in in the computer most likely the processes are calculated with a floating point uh, number which has even larger resolution so why is this resolution crucial well it has everything to do with the dynamic range right between loud and soft uh, sound um, so if you if you are anticipating a large gain increase then uh, it is useful to have a very high resolution bit rate uh, actually I shouldn't say bit rate because that has more to do with transfer online I should keep using the bit depth uh, term so dynamic range uh, also you get more accuracy at low amplitudes uh, and again in terms of calculations processing uh, the digital signal uh, you get less rounding errors so it can be useful okay so that's the brief introduction to sampling uh, and now we get into oscillations so what is a, 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 an oscillation uh, or, or should I briefly talk well I shouldn't talk I think the other videos will explain the super collider side of things uh, how you can change the sample rate there and all the rest of it so we'll focus on, on theory here although I should do quite a few uh, demos in super collider okay so what is an oscillation an oscillation is a product of something that oscillates which means it moves back and forth swings back and forth typically at regular speed um, if the speed is regular then we call this oscillation to have a property called frequency which is the rate uh, or the speed at which something is repeated at which something oscillates back and forth up and down whatever it does uh, so these are fairly broad terms uh, obviously uh, 
many other things have frequency, not only the sound. I don't know, the, the day and night has a certain frequency to it, uh, which is fairly regular. Uh, I eat my meals at a certain frequency, less regular normally. Um, okay, and then the period of an oscillation is a crucial uh, property, it's the second crucial property, and it has everything to do with the pattern, the actual single recurring pattern of this oscillation, that's what we call a period. Okay, so the way we define frequency is how many periods do we get at a fixed duration and typically the unit Hertz uh, is defined as the amount of periods per second. Okay. So if something is at 1 Hertz my clock is sticking at 1 Hertz. Okay, so uh, obviously we've mentioned the higher limit of hearing, which is about 17, 18 kilohertz, which is uh, thousands of hertz, so 17, 18 thousand hertz. That's the amount of back and forths in air pressure that we can still um, perceive as a fixed frequency sound. Uh, so the question arises, what is the lower boundary of hearing? Well, typically people say 25 hertz, 20 hertz. Uh, again, you need large amplitudes, but I would add to that, uh, that is something uh, to say about sine waves, because I cannot perceive a sine wave at 15 hertz, but uh, my clock is sticking at one hertz and I can perceive that, right? So uh, the point here is that obviously we perceive lower um, period uh, cycles, lower frequency cycles, it is just not giving us a sensation of a pitch. Okay, so you can actually say that 120 BPM tune is actually something which has a period of 2 Hertz and indeed you hear that, it's a beat, it's a pulsation. So uh, worth noting in terms of keeping our terms uh, accurate here few more things that oscillate, great stuff, whether mood, vocal folds, guitar strings, drum heads, CPU clocks, a lot of things. Okay, so let's discuss uh, the most basic physical system that produces an oscillation, which is a pendulum. Uh, I won't go into the physics of this, if you're interested obviously you can look it up. I'll say a few interesting things though. Uh, typically the crucial thing to understand here is that there is an inverse uh, proportion in action here. So the point is that if you consider this zero position and consider this positive position, positive numbers describe these positions and these numbers, these positions are described by negative numbers then there is an inverse proportion between position and force. And that's the, that's the crucial thing. So if my position is positive, then my force is negative. It goes in the negative direction. And if my position is negative, my force is positive. Okay, so actually that's the crucial thing uh, that you need to uh, understand in, in order to implement this, for example. Uh, I won't go into implementation of a pendulum. It's actually a second order filter, really. Uh, look it up. Hopefully you're excited if I say complex things that you can look up. Um, suffice it to say uh, that if you have a position then the speed is the differential of that position. So it is the difference between two consecutive positions over a fixed time interval. And acceleration is the differential of the speed. And therefore, uh, the speed is the integral of acceleration and position is the second integral of acceleration. <coughs> 
So that's the other side of the equation. So all in all, what you have to do is you take the second differential of uh, excitation signal. It could be just a single impulse. Take the second uh, integral and multiply by minus factor. Invert that and feed it back into the system and you will get an oscillating system. So this is a very rough explanation, but it's, it's, it's kind of interesting if you understand the math be behind uh, integration, differentiation, and all the rest. Uh, but once we get into filters, uh, you will see how actually a self-oscillating filter right, is producing actually a model of a pendulum. So we'll get to that later. Historically, first oscillator that we've ever used, uh, timekeeping, was extremely accurate timekeeper. Uh, ghost busting hell yeah subconscious tracking mm, sweet so um, the interesting things about the pendulum is that uh, the frequency of it going back and forth is as good as independent of the amplitude of the excursion okay so it doesn't really matter how far the pendulum goes left and right the time uh, it takes for it to go left and right uh, will be as good as same. The other interesting thing is that the frequency is pretty much independent of the mass of this bob or weight. Okay, so you can maybe try this in a park on a swing. So the theory says that if you sit on a swing and next to you a kid sits on a swing, uh, you will swing at the same speed regardless of the weight of the person and regardless of the amplitude. Which kind of makes sense because if, you, if you're swinging back and forth a lot, if the amplitude is large, then you feel the speed is higher, right? That's why we, we normally swing plenty, kids do. I probably have to puke. I think I've tried swinging 10 years after my last attempt and it really felt nauseous. Um, so in any case, if you are going larger excursions, you actually go faster. So it kind of makes sense that, you know, the time it takes before, between uh, the uh, extreme excursion points is pretty much the same as if your amplitude is low. Okay, so what the frequency of the pendulum is proportional to is the square root of the length of the pendulum, right? So that's your uh, experiment in the park. If the swing cords are equally long, then um, the frequency should be the same regardless of the mass and the excursion. Uh, and then maybe you notice or you have had a chance to swing on a huge swing above a lake mounted to a treetop which goes really slow whatever okay some history there Huygens Dutch guy we love Dutch guys uh, I do <laughs> people think I'm Dutch hell yeah no problem with that um, look up the history of it I don't want to spend too much time with this Okay, so other things that oscillate, which are slightly more relevant, are strings. And here the frequency is most, uh, uh, mostly uh, controlled by the length of the string. That's how we started measuring frequencies, back to the Greeks, all of that. But you obviously know that the tension of the string here is quite crucial for the frequency as well. And then uh, the interesting thing about a string is that uh, it produces overtones, uh, whereas the pendulum didn't. So that's the one thing I didn't say about the pendulum. It actually produces a sine wave. So uh, uh, a physically ideal pendulum, let's put it that way, without uh, friction, uh, which is totally linear in terms of the force in relation to the position, uh, will produce a sine wave. Uh, if there is friction, it will produce a dampened sine wave, which kind of slowly comes back. If there is no friction in the medium, it will be a sine wave forever. Okay, so I'll talk about the sine wave and its properties in a bit. Um, 
but worth uh, saying here is that the string will produce something more than just a sine wave it will produce overtones or harmonics frequencies that are higher than the fundamental so overtone is a term that covers uh, related oscillations that are higher than the fundamental frequency whereas harmonics uh, describe overtones which are integer multiples of the fundamental okay so a harmonic sound like a string will have harmonics uh, but uh, an inharmonic sound like a bell will have uh, overtones as well as harmonics potentially okay so there is some difficulty in fully understanding this uh, superposition of overtones because you kind of understand that there is a single string how is it creating multiple oscillations at the same time uh, I would say that the the multiple oscillations actually has to do with the way we analyze this complex motion uh, so it shouldn't be such a mystery but sometimes it appears to be uh, because we actually have a, a spectral analyzer in our ears so we we take a complex sound and we dissect it we, we uh, figure out the, the the smaller components in terms of different frequencies in terms of different frequency components and that's the way we think about sound as well uh, but actually it's a it's a it's a single object it's a single motion now it's worth saying maybe here is uh, that typically all our studies of audio uh, are bound by the point source paradigm so we kind of consider that a sound in space can be described by the pressure uh, variation of a single point in space whatever a single point in space means by the way um, and that is a problematic thing because even the things that we want to be point sources like tweeters uh, and otherwise cones aren't point sources and they uh, radiate different spectral envelopes in different directions and a string especially has a certain extent and there are different pressure variations radiating from different positions of this string so the point source paradigm is a really useful thing because it allows us to understand anything about these complex um, oscillations and, and um, transmissions but actually it's a it's a serious simplification and probably the reason why we still can recognize whether we are in uh, in the room with the instrument or whether it's a uh, speaker reproduction because typically speakers are designed based on the point source uh, paradigm and instruments aren't point sources they, they emit com complex um, characteristics in different directions from different positions so it's much more complex than that okay so a little um, now let's look at the strings then uh, so here is an oscillating string so if we analyze it we could say that these are the components of the motion uh, and indeed uh, what you have is uh, a sense of superposition because uh, if you play a guitar you probably know that you can mute certain harmonics right so in in a in a basic situation with a string which is fixed at two ends uh, which also holds for a pipe which is uh, uh, closed at two ends uh, what you have is that the, the basic oscillation mode uh, has to do with this uh, extent in space which will correspond to the period uh, duration according to the speed of sound in that medium and the pressure variation uh, will be the largest in the middle 
because at the boundary there is a, a, a fixed boundary so physically there is no room for uh, for uh, excursion here okay so the largest excursion of a string will be in the middle which is something you see as well probably now when this largest excursion comes into oscillation uh, it will have the fundamental frequency it, it kind of draws out uh, a half of the sine wave period uh, now the other the next mode up will be the octave above with half the period length and typically this mode will have no excursion in the middle you see because for this mode to come uh, to exist uh, you need to squeeze in the full period of the cycle and that's why if you lightly touch the middle of the string on a guitar what you will get is the loss of the fundamental and you will typically hear a pitch which is an octave above the fundamental and curiously you will not only dampen the uh, fundamental but you will also dampen the third harmonic the fifth harmonic you're damping all the odd harmonics because they they rely on maximum excursion at this point okay uh, and that's why you actually end up with a different harmonic series and that's why you get this octave sound because actually if the third harmonic was still very present you would not hear the octave above we will look at a demo of this uh, in a bit and then the other interesting thing is that if I lightly touch the string at the third of its length then you see I will be uh, muting the fundamental a bit the uh, sorry this is the fundamental the fundamental the second harmonic the fourth harmonic the fifth harmonic but the sixth harmonic you see uh, I will not be able to mute if I limit the excursion at this point and if you look at that harmonic series if you expand those you will see that this is actually the second harmonic of this oscillation right so again I am managing to mute or at least attenuate all the harmonics that don't belong to the harmonic series of this oscillation so this is how it works with uh, lightly touching the strings on a guitar and in, in other uh, one-dimensional physical systems as well. So the other few things you can understand from this is that uh, close to the edges, right? if you mute uh, close to the edges, then you're typically muting very high frequencies. right? So this works on a two-dimensional object on a drum skin as well. If you mute in the middle, then you're typically muting the lower harmonics. Same for the drum as well. Okay, so that's one case. Uh, and then you, we have a case of a single fixed termination of a one-dimensional object in terms of it oscillating, in terms of its natural oscillation. Uh, because if the point here is that if this object is flexible and you strike it, it will dissipate the energy of the strike uh, at its resonant frequency, right? And it can be the same object, but if it's fixed at both ends compared to it being fixed at a single end, you will have a different fundamental frequency. Okay? So, uh, Obviously, if you have a string fixed at one end, it doesn't have a really strong resonant frequency, so it won't quite play the pitch, but you can do this with pipes. So if I have a pipe which is closed at one end, uh, what I have is a system that will produce only odd harmonics, and here is a sketch. So the fundamental will relate to the length of the pipe by a fourfold. You see, this is only a fourth of a full cycle of an oscillation uh, and this will also apply to reeds and rulers things that are fixed at one end and have a strong resonance uh, and then the next 
mode will actually relate to one and a half uh, times the uh, the length here so actually three quarters sorry I said it the other way around uh, because again the 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 open end will produce the largest excursion be it uh, in position for reeds and rulers or for uh, pressure variation in pipes and if you look at this you will see that there is no second harmonic the system which is fixed at single dimensional system fixed at one end does not have a second harmonic it has the fifth one as well but not the fourth right so it has only odd harmonics uh, which is curious because as we see uh, synthetic waveforms some of them have a similar property great interference uh, so let's talk about how different oscillations interact or interfere typically we define them to interfere constructively or destructively and the way they uh, interfere will very much depend on the frequency difference uh, and the time offset or the delay or the phase between these things these oscillations so one of my favorite anecdotes here is one plus one is not two in signals in sine waves because if you add two sine waves of the same frequency you still get a single sine wave okay so these oscillations add up in a different way from material stuff I won't go into quantum physical and uh, otherwise uh, exciting bits is is matter just an, an oscillation or are there particles which actually move back and forth um, what is my conviction uh, I'm not sure I, I won't go into this I think honestly I think that the whole uh, statistics has to fail uh, because of quantum mechanical findings I think statistics is the is the weakest link in the chain more so than uh, other links let's not go into that um, okay so we're talking about sine waves of the same frequency you add them together be it in uh, electronic circuits be it in space be it uh, in digital system uh, you will get only a single sine wave out of there and you will never be able to know that there were two sine waves originally so they fully merge so to speak uh, and how they merge depends on the phase okay so if they're in phase uh, they will reinforce each other constructive interference doubling the amplitude if they're f exactly out of phase then they cancel each other out so in audio it is impossible it is possible to use other audio signals to attenuate uh, another audio signal so hence the noise cancelling headphones and if you really listen carefully you understand that there is something wrong with the reproduction there's something stupid happens with the phase it's more difficult with bass frequencies it's not straightforward to cancel sound complex sound uh, but in an electronic system with uh, with oscillations we can actually totally cancel s uh, sound out and in fact uh, typically if you want to verify that uh, a complex sound is unprocessed you flip the phase and you add it to the original and you need there to be only silence left otherwise uh, there is an anomaly in the system so typically if you want to test uh, your lossless audio conversion you can do this convert the audio back and forth what you get invert the phase add to the original and if you have only silence left then you know that it's the exact uh, it, it was actually a lossless compression uh, investigate right uh, worth adding uh, here is if you really believe everything that I say then this is a religious uh, event uh, so you have to stay skeptical and investigate and I might easily say something that's wrong uh, 
so uh, stay skeptical and and, uh, and and look it up look stuff up and keep exploring keep testing things out okay so here it is uh, interference of identical frequencies here the two oscillators are in phase you add them up which means that you add each sample to each next sample not uh, sorry I should say next sample each pairwise set of samples so the ones that are horizontally aligned in the two waveforms you take this value add it to that value and obviously you get double the value when you add two zeros you get a zero and so forth now if they're out of phase then you probably see it plus one plus minus one is zero and actually every sample value here has the exact uh, negative value corresponding therefore every sum of corresponding samples is zero so you cancel the signal out and then here we have uh, two signals which are slightly out of phase and what you get there is a different phase and a different amplitude so it's not exact same phase double amplitude it is a slightly different phase from both of these signals phase meaning the time offset right so if, if you want to look at the phase you look at where does the waveform start here it both starts at zero going up here it's inverse so starting going down but still starts at zero and these are out of phase you see this one starts somewhere and then the sum starts in a completely different place if you want to look it up trigonometry mathematics you can actually calculate the exact phase of this signal when you add up these two and you can calculate the exact amplitude uh, but the crucial thing is that you still have a single sine wave coming out and there is no way of telling that you've created this sine wave by summing two other sine waves okay now if you have close frequencies similar frequencies what you get is beating okay so essentially what you get is the waves going in and out of phase so here they start in phase so you get constructive interference they double in amplitude but as you see this one is slightly faster slightly higher frequency the bottom one so slowly it goes out of phase with the top signal and at this point it is completely out of phase see this is a trough and this is a peak so at this stage they completely cancel each other out so depending on the frequency difference here you will get a beating pattern which will be an increase and decrease in amplitude uh, and actually the frequency of this amplitude increase and decrease is the exact difference of these two frequencies and again if you're investigative and love maths uh, look it up in trigonometry you will find the exact equation that will tell you that summing two sine waves which is what happens here equals multiplication of two sine waves because you can consider this to be a multiplication of the slow uh, beating pattern with the underlying sine wave great now in terms of phase um, there's a lot to be said and actually uh, I think I, I probably shouldn't do many demos because I'm really stretching the theory here I'm in 19 out of 44 bloody hell I don't want to tire you to death although I do expect that this is really exciting it definitely is for me even though I'm repeating it 12th year in a row now uh, but still still uh, I find it quite uh, quite something uh, so yeah about the phase uh, I'm trying to keep it short uh, typically what you read in ancient textbooks is that we are not sensitive to phase uh, psychoacoustics actually you can find some videos on psychoacoustics that I've uh, recorded as well uh, psychoacoustics was initially based on these simple uh, waveforms and indeed if I have a sine wave I've shifted a bit 
you don't hear the difference is the same old sine wave now i've just said that in terms of the phase difference between the two years we're actually sensitive to uh, higher time resolution than we are in terms of oscillation altogether in terms of the maximum frequency you hear so actually we are really sensitive to phase it is just the question in which scenario and typically you know phase aligning uh, the, the drivers in a speaker in terms of the tweeter and the, and the woofer you know millimeters can make a difference here and um, so the, it's a really vast topic to explore, which I won't go into. But what is worth showing here, because we're dealing with these basic sine waves, is that the waveform actually depends a lot on the phases of the components. Okay, so one of these early textbook claims is that you know, with the waveform you can describe a sound okay true but not with the waveform of a single period okay so the point here is that these two sounds will sound totally identical but they look different okay so the the actual waveform uh, can be changed in many ways and you will still hear the exact same sound uh, does it work the other way around? Same waveform, different sound? Probably not. But in any case, worth noting that the way things add up and the way we hear things uh, is a distinct set of categories. Okay, so maybe I can uh, accelerate at this point. Uh, oscillators obviously will produce periodic vibrations uh, that are audible basing building blocks typically they will have a fundamental frequency a waveform shape uh, the basic things we're looking at are sine waves which has no harmonics it is the pure signal sawtooth square triangle pulse uh, so what you will have is that um, a pulse wave here is a kind of a duty cycle modulated square wave I'll show you this one in a second but typically what you have is that if a waveform is symmetrical, a midpoint symmetrical horizontally, then it will have only odd harmonics. So sawtooth is not midpoint symmetrical or midline symmetrical, I should say. Uh, and uh, duty cycle modulated square wave or a pulse wave similarly is not um, symmetrical like that and therefore it will have all harmonics both odd and even and then noise generators are referred to noise oscillators often so briefly about the sine wave we've seen it before pendulum produces a perfect sine wave what are the interesting parameters we've talked about the cycle length uh, uh, or the period duration uh, and then the peak amplitude is another uh, important parameter we'll talk about this it has everything to do with how loud it is uh, it has everything to do with trigonometrical sine and cosines. Uh, probably won't go into how they are synthesized deep inside the engines, uh, kind of keep it floating above that level of engineering. Obviously, Super Collider will reach quite deeply into synthesis, but typically we don't code our own oscillators in Super Collider. Um, Okay, so if it is an of infinite duration, a sine wave is actually in the narrowest possible spectral peak. Okay, I will talk about spectrum, we'll talk about analysis uh, at a later point, but I, uh, I reckon you already understand that spectrum uh, is a way of describing the frequency content of a complex signal. Uh, so you plot energy typically uh, across different frequency ranges and that's your spectral plot so the most narrow spectral peak means that it is the most precise spectral uh, phenomenon that we know of 
But the funny thing is that it is most precise only when it's of infinite duration, believe it or not. If, if I have a sine wave that I stop after two days, it's actually not infinitely narrow spectrally. Uh, and if I stop it after one second, it's even broader. And if I stop it within five cycles, then it's actually quite broad. And you hear it as well. You don't hear it as a, as a clean sine wave. So I briefly mentioned that our, our basic approach to complex signals is uh, a decomposition into sine waves, um, which is great, uh, but nevertheless uh, constraining. Um, probably get into this at some point. Um, and then obviously when we dissect complex sounds, uh, we have more to talk about in terms of different amount of energy, different spectral peaks, uh, and all of these properties that we analyze then uh, contribute to what we call the timbre, the tone color of the sound, which is a kind of a funny broad term. You can't really pin it down. Uh, I think there is a definition somewhere which is a negative definition. It tells you what timbre is not and then all the rest is timbre. Okay, so here we have a sawtooth wave. It looks like this. Uh, and typically, if you produce this electronically, you have these very sharp edges and you have an infinite amount of harmonics. Uh, in a digital system, it's slightly different. I'll get into this in a bit. So how do the harmonics work out for a sawtooth wave? Well, here they are you have both even and odd harmonics, so every integer multiple. So if this is 400, then you have 800, 1200, 1600, and so on hertz. And these are the amplitudes, so they're progressively diminishing. So the second harmonic is at half the amplitude, third harmonic, third the amplitude, fourth the amplitude, and so to infinity or to the Nyquist frequency, as we shall see in a di di digital system. Here's a square wave. The difference here is that the even harmonics are missing, uh, but the amplitudes of the other of the remaining harmonics are the same series of numbers. And here is a triangle wave, which is similar to a square wave. So you see they're both mid-line symmetrical, but here the harmonics are lower amplitude, right? So the third harmonic has only a ninth of the amplitude. Okay, uh, so the interesting thing to note is that we can look at a sound character in terms of a continuum between a pure sinusoid, which is the narrowest spectral occurrence, to white noise, which is the broadest. Okay, so uh, if you followed the exercises previous exercises or the other linked uh, super collider content, then you've heard these things, you know what I'm talking about. And then everything in between could be complex sound. So what you have actually, the, as the complexity of sound increases, we just can't hear out the complexity anymore. It kind of merges into noise, right? So if you have five people talking, you can still hear them out. But if you have five 50,000 people talking, it just becomes one big wash of sound. Okay. Uh, and here's the spectral plot. No, this is not the spectral plot here. These lower ones are the spectral plots. So the funny thing is that an infinite sine wave has an infinitely narrow peak here. Uh, a pulse and a noise, a pulse is not depicted here but these have flat spectrum, so they have infinitely broad spectrum. Uh, and that's what you get. Now, talking about the pitch and the frequency. Now, it's important to understand that pitch is a perceptual phenomenon. There are uh, sounds uh, that would make us disagree as to what the pitch of the sound is. Uh, bells other synthesized sounds can be produced such that we don't agree what the pitch is. Typically, instrumental sounds are such that we agree on the pitch. Uh, 
Uh, and the interesting thing to note is that if you plot pitch or actually frequency against pitch, what you get is an exponential curve because what you have is that the increment in pitch is actually a multiplication scaling in frequency. Okay, so we'll talk about this. Essentially what you have here is that if you go from A4 to A5, so if you jump an octave, you double the frequency. So this is 440 to 880. And if you go an octave from A5 to A6, you cannot just add 440, you actually have to double the 880. So you end up at 1760. Okay, so for each octave, you have to multiply with two, or if you want to go an octave down, you have to divide by two. So similarly, for, for any smaller interval, if I want to go one semitone above A4, A sharp four, I have to multiply with the value. It's not a fixed value in Hertz. A semitone is a fixed multiplier, and I can use that multiplier on any frequency. I can multiply 880 with that number and I will get the A sharp 5 just as I did with 440. So the question is what that multiplier is. We'll look at that. Uh, by the way, similar thing holds for uh, amplitude. Okay, so the amplitude is not linearly related to the loudness. Uh, so what is this magical number? It is this magical number. It is 2 to the power of 1 over 12. Okay, so you can observe this. Maybe it's clearer than the way I've just explained it. But essentially what you need is a multiplier that when used 12 times, right? So I start at C, I multiply once, I get a C sharp. Multiply again, I get a D. Multiply again, multiply again. So I have to multiply 12 times to get to an octave. And the one number that 12 times itself will yield number two is the 12th root of number two, right? So if I take this number, which is something like 1.059 times 1.059 times 1.059 and 12 times do that, I will get exactly two. Right, So that's how you calculate this. And then you also see that if you want to divide your octave in a different number of parts, not 12 semitones, but 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever, you can do that as well. Okay. Uh, great. So I, I see it already. What I'll do probably is I'll uh, have all these examples uh, that I wanted to show set up as exercises. And then in the exercise solution videos, I will actually demonstrate those. So it's a bigger challenge to produce these things. Uh, briefly, this is your equation if you want to go from note numbers. So these are MIDI pitch values, uh, which are linear. And therefore you have this power thing if you want to calculate frequency for MIDI. And if you want to calculate MIDI from frequency, that's possible as well. And you have to play with the logarithms there. I won't go into this. I've already mentioned that uh, harmonics are different term from uh, overtones. Worth noting is that the fundamental frequency is called the first harmonic. So the next overtone, the first overtone is the second harmonic. Uh, just so you can get confused. Um, And then the interesting thing, so will become part of the exercises, is that if you have a harmonic series, but you remove certain harmonics, you will still have the same pitch. This is what we call the missing fundamental. Okay, odd position for this one. Uh, this is a square wave duty cycle, so what I call the pulse wave, just so you see what happens here. So this is a square wave, and if you move the middle point, then you get a different uh, waveform. Uh, you increase the higher harmonics, the amplitude of higher harmonics, you introduce even harmonics if you do that, and you go slowly to what we call a pulse train, if it's just narrow as possible pulses in a sequence. Uh, this is also related 
to what we call PWM, pulse width modulation, which is actually the way you control the brightness of an LED in electronics, if you're acquainted with that. And then finally, one big chapter is everything to do with aliasing. So I won't go into much detail here, but the crucial term is band limited oscillators. And what it means is that your oscillator is strictly limited in terms of the maximum frequency. And the result is a square wave that looks like this. So the thing to remember is that a geometrically perfect square wave, which this one is not, is perfect in analog domain. So you can create a square wave by using a switch in electronics, if you switch it back and forth very rapidly. But in a digital domain, if you do that, you will get aliasing. So you will have certain harmonics mirrored back from the Nyquist frequency, which we introduced earlier. So a perfect digital square wave looks like this. And that's the thing to remember. Uh, and similarly, sawtooth wave will have these ripples and all the other waves that are geometrically defined in a digital system, they will have these ripples. And the only way you can synthesize them will be by adding sine waves because you don't know how many harmonics will be valid because it depends on the sample rate, which is normally fixed, but it depends also on the frequency of your wave, of your oscillator. So typically, if you have a higher frequency oscillator, you need to synthesize less harmonics. And there is no quick way of doing this. So actually, if you want to synthesize a low frequency square wave, you really have to synthesize 10, maybe 20 sine waves in a very special uh, order in order to get a wave that looks like this, which is then your digital square wave. Cool. And then about arbitrary waveforms. So the, the, the thing to understand at this stage uh, is that if you have a fixed waveform, and play it back, it's just going to be a buzz, no matter how beautiful, no matter how conceptually genius uh, your uh, waveform is, it is just a buzz. And actually, it doesn't contain any overtones except the harmonics. And this is a, a, a tough thing to grasp uh, at the very beginning, even for people who have used synthesis but without uh, a deeper study will kind of be surprised or not even believe it but it's something that we can demonstrate easily and we will do so if you are repeating a single waveform you are just changing the amplitude of different harmonics okay now maybe i should say aliasing excluded uh, okay, because aliasing will produce non-harmonic components. But if, if you don't have an aliased, if you have a band-limited waveform, I should be accurate like that, then you're strictly producing harmonics. And this is everything to do with uh, Fourier theory, which we will go into. Uh, so typically, if you want to do something with wavetables, with funny waveforms, these waveforms have to change over time. Otherwise, it's, it's just a stupid buzz. Uh, and this is something that is also a remnant of the old school theory when where people were really amused by beautiful waveforms and how they can tell us everything about the sound. OK, so waveforms, typically you play them back with wavetables. So this is something we're going to look in the practical bit. Uh, typically, you have a way of playing back a wavetable by l indexing it. And typically you do this with a sawtooth wave. So we will look at this in the practical bit because you're actually going from the beginning to the end uh, in a certain duration of time. And then you drop to zero, you suddenly go all the way back to zero and start reading again. That's how you read a wavetable. And then if you do that, 
what you get is um, a buzz. <laughs> a horrible buzz, trust me. No, don't trust me, try it out. Okay. Uh, and then we have another technique here, which is called wave shaping, which can be, uh, which is also typically using a wave table, but it is, um, it, it, it can be used on any other sound. Actually, there is some ter terminological uh, issue here. People call wave shaping, use wave shaping for different things. We won't go into that. Um, and then the funny thing is once we are into the wave table synthesis, which we will scratch the surface of, you will see that you know you can actually have your reading oscillator be a different waveform and it will produce a different wave reading, right? So because actually what you're doing here is you have a kind of a buffer type uh, system. So you, you have a set of data and then you're using an oscillator to read through this data. And typically you read at a fixed speed from the beginning to the end and back again. But you can play with the reading of it and it will produce interesting things. So typically you could morph this waveform in order to get a gradually changing um, output, which we will look at. Here are a few examples. Curving it also gives you a slightly different output. Okay, that's about it. In harmonic sounds, I've kind of mentioned these things. Uh, you can pause it, read it. Uh, really don't want to bore you for too long. Uh, my throat is dry as well. I think we've covered a good amount of um, exciting stuff. Uh, so here's an inverse uh, proposition. You remember me saying that you cannot have inharmonic partials in a repeating waveform. So here is one way of looking at this from the other perspective is that if you have in harmonic partials, so only three frequencies. Uh, you just don't see the period of anything. It, it, it's already totally uh, messy. So you could not take one period of this and keep repeating it. If you took one period of this, let's say this is one period, then actually you wouldn't be getting these frequencies anymore. They would align, which is an interesting experiment to try. Uh, a bit over the top. I'll, I'll come up with some neat exercises uh, and post that as well. Uh, similar example there. A um, useful term, amplitude envelopes. We'll get to this, obviously. Pause it and read it if you're interested. Good stuff there. Uh, exponential decay has to do with amplitude envelopes. Uh, we will be looking at this as well in more detail, probably uh, in the practical exercise, uh, because typically the way the energy dissipates in an acoustic system has this exponential decay to it and not a linear one. So we will be listening to linear decays, exponential decays. Hear, hear what you think. Hmm, hear what you think. Exciting. Marimba decay, blah, blah, some exercises. So if you want to make sure that you get the math, I suggest you pause and try and do these. Uh, the kind of exercises that we will be focusing on in this course will be practical super collider stuff. So probably won't go into these, but uh, if it excites you, you don't know the answer, just get in touch. Okay, so thanks for sticking through if you have done so. If not, you're not hearing this. Um, and well, yeah, I, I hope you liked it. Uh, let me know what you thought. And uh, looking forward to creating a comprehensive course on synthesis, processing and analysis in this fashion. Stay safe. Bye bye.